Well, we begin our meditation on God's word this morning in the powerful and sweet name of Jesus, dear Christian friends. Well, sometimes people have this picture of God that makes him, well, less serious. In other words, sometimes they have this picture of a, a kind of a lighthearted or touchy-feely kind of God or, or maybe a grandfatherly type of God who absentmindedly bounces his children on his knee and, and likes to have fun, too. He, um, he has a sense of humor, and he's willing to look the other way when we're a little bit naughty sometimes. But the problem with this picture some people have of God is that it doesn't square with the picture that we have of him in his word. It's contrary to what a lot of people want to think about God, he is actually quite serious. And this is one of those places in God's word where we're reminded today that God doesn't play games. The first way we want to see that is when it comes to suffering, God doesn't play games with suffering and something else he doesn't play games with, and that is repentance. Well, as we turn to the book of Hosea today, chapter 1, it must have sounded like kind of a sick game at first. At the very beginning of the book, God comes to Hosea, and in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Go and marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. It must have sounded like a sick game at first to Hosea. But this really happened. God actually came to Hosea the prophet, a man of God, and he commanded him to marry a prostitute. It, I'm not kidding. It's a true story. It's not just made up. It's not a parable of some kind. It actually happened. Hosea was told by God to marry this prostitute by the name of Gomer, and bears, she bears him three children. And then after that, she leaves him for another man. She actually goes on with her work as a prostitute, and then that's when God comes to Hosea a second time and says, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. Wow. Our relationship with God is actually pictured as a marriage relationship. And God's point to the people of Israel is to show them that just as Hosea's wife, this adulteress, had been unfaithful to him, so had Israel been unfaithful to the Lord. By her, her turning away to her sin and, and following after and, and loving the things of this world more than their Lord. And so... This wasn't a game with Hosea just to amuse his people, although you, you can just imagine the kind of looks and stares that Hosea must have received. But it was meant to show that God means business when it comes to his relationship with his people and that um, he wanted to get Israel thinking. In, in chapter 6, verse 4, our text now, he says, What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. That doesn't sound to me like a God who's just far and away and, and detached, somehow uninterested in things here below. It sounds like a God who has his people in his heart, and he is deeply hurt and offended by her spiritual adultery. A little while later in Hosea 11, you, you get to look into the heart of God a little more. He opens up and he says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim, my, 
My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. As Israel is playing the harlot, she is driving a wedge in between her relationship with the Lord and, and herself. She's trading in a love for the Lord for her own sin. And again, for a love of the things of this world. As God put it to the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, she had lost her first love. Well, what do you do? What do you do when someone you love is, is heading off in the wrong direction? What do you do to get her attention? How, how, do, you, how do you wake her up out of, of all that and turn her back? Yesterday, I, I, had a, I had a fun time. I went to something that was just delightful. It was a, a play at my old high school. It was a, the Dr. Seuss version of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, my niece was playing Juliet, by the way, and in one part of Shakespeare's production, you remember how Juliet cries out to her, her would-be suitor, lovingly and plaintively, uh, you know, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? And, and in this Dr. Seuss version of the play, Juliet has a megaphone out, and she's literally calling out, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? What do you do when you need to get the attention of someone you actually care about? Sometimes you have to get out the megaphone. And that's what God does again and again through his prophets. In verse 5, he said, Therefore I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. It's a figure of speech, isn't it? But in a very real way, it represents what God was trying to do through his law and gospel. It's like God is throwing up his arms and he's saying, what am I supposed to do with you, Israel? I sent my prophets with my law again and again to condemn your sinful ways, to cut open your stubborn hearts. Yes, with my word again and again, I tried to break through your sinful old Adam, but you would not turn back to me. And what you end up having is, is, in a, is a situation where God is like this frustrated parent um, just slamming his hands down on the table. Or, or it's like the, the, the housewife slamming the cupboard door because she can't get the attention of others or the teen shouting because no one's listening. It's an anger, isn't it? And a frustration. It's a frustration and anger that comes out of a place of fear when you feel like you're losing control of things. Of course, with God now, this is different. These words of God and the words that sound like frustration and anger don't come from a place of weakness whatsoever. He is the Lord God Almighty. And when it comes to leading us to repentance, he doesn't play games. Finally, Finally, after all the years of calling out to her through the prophets, God turns to what is his last resort. He, he allows some hardship and suffering to come into Israel's life. What else could he do? Not even a megaphone wasn't working, so he has to speak even louder through some harsh discipline. By the way, this has been going on for years, too. Hosea has been at it through four successive kingdoms. And there were prophets that God had sent even before Hosea came along and still she failed to repent. So this has been a long time coming that God finally now let Israel feel some of the consequences of her sin. She had been warned not to turn to pagan unbelieving nations to serve as her allies in fighting against her neighbors. And when she did, they turned on her and God let her feel some of those consequences. The Assyrians, their neighbors to the north, came in and, and they acted as like a paw of a lion in God's hand to tear her away and uproot her from the land, carrying her into exile and scattering her all over the Assyrian Empire. And that's when we have the verses in our text, chapter 5, verse 15. Then I will return to my lair. God says, until they admit their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. As sometimes when we suffer, we feel like God is playing games. 
And what must Israel have thought when God allowed their cities and towns to be overrun by the Assyrians and siege works and their soldiers? Why is God doing this? They must have wondered. Why is he letting this trouble come down on us? But no answer came back from the Lord. At least not right away. You can imagine how they must have felt. When a family member that you love gives you the silent treatment, or when a, a friend is avoiding you and someone won't return your calls or your texts, it hurts, doesn't it? It really bothers you. That's, that's how it feels sometimes when God allows hardships to come into our life. Where is God? People ask when things go wrong. And, and why isn't he here involved in my situation and making things turn out for the better? And that was a situation in Israel. They were wondering and waiting. God let them stew. And again, for what purpose? He says, until they admit their guilt. So God hadn't left them, but he let them think. He let them know that he doesn't play games when it comes to repentance, and he was playing no game with this time of suffering. Now remember, very carefully remember, the Bible doesn't say that all of our suffering is a, a punishment for sin or a consequence for sin. When we suffer, we shouldn't automatically assume that somehow God is punishing us for some specific sin. Our, our sufferings usually have nothing to do with our sin, it, it is simply the sad result of living in a sin-fallen world that many troubles and hardships come into our lives. And it is a pointless journey of guilt to try and see some kind of connection between our previous sin and current suffering. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes it is true that suffering comes as a consequence for sin. So a man drinks to excess his whole life, and he finds that he suffers severe health problems. Or a husband is, is cold and uncaring to his wife, and, and, she wonder, and he wonders why she won't support him. Or a mom is harsh and uncaring or, and overcritical with her children and wonders why later in life no one comes to visit her. And these are examples, and we have one in our text with Israel, the day of how sometimes God does allow his people to feel those consequences of their self-serving ways and why he's not playing games. It's because he, he isn't willing to give up on us. He loves us too much. He loves us with an everlasting love. Never will I leave you or forsake you, God says. And God is willing to do anything and, and to go to any even great lengths to do whatever he can sometimes, getting out the megaphone of his law and even hardships and trials, if need be, to turn us away from unrepentant sin. Yes, even though his people were suffering, behind it all was a God of free and faithful love who desired to bless them well, eternally. Even after all this now, it seems that Israel was still playing games with repentance. Look in chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. They say the Lord has torn us to pieces and he has injured us. But what they're really referring to was not a painful knowledge of their own sin and guilt, but instead... Just the fact that they had to suffer some setbacks and some of these, these international incursions and, and losses and battles, they were just sad because they lost and they had to pay that price. Well, she gives a, a wonderful description of the Lord's patience here. Beautiful. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him as surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come like the winter rains, like the spring rains that, that water the earth. A beautiful, beautiful song indeed. Lord's favor, it's always been there for us like the winter and spring rains that water the fields and produce a harvest. And, and, and won't God's blessings and mercies continue to come down on us again? 
But the Lord saw through it. You can tell in his words later at the end of our text. He'd heard this song before. Yes, we see how Israel wasn't really true when it came to this, this, these words that sounded appealing. God said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. An acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And when he says, I desire mercy, what that word really means is faithful love. He wanted true worship from them, and that's not what they were giving. Yes, he, he didn't want just a few nice songs and a going through the motions, even a repentant song once and now again, and maybe even generous sacrifice of time or offerings to make up for things. No, God doesn't play games. He knows hearts. When it comes to our relationship with him, he would not let Israel manipulate him in some outward way on the Sabbath, only to carelessly turn back to her sin the following week without any thought of repentance. God doesn't play games, not with suffering, not with repentance. And so the lesson for us, my goodness, let us never, ever, Resist the work of the Spirit in his word. Thank him that he continues to turn us around in faith and away from sin and to the cross day in and day out. Apply his word, the law and the gospel to your hearts. Sincerely think about your sin every day. Remember how dearly it cost your Savior. And most of all, remember that he in his great love was willing to take that sin away. He loved us with with his everlasting love we see so clearly in the season of Lent. As we make our journey ever closer to that cross of Good Friday, we remember how Jesus took our, our burden of sin and carried it all away. That Savior served us on the cross. And now as we find comfort and assurance and forgiveness in his love and sacrifice, we seek to love and serve him in the same way he saved us. Yes, remember that. Remember that God, he doesn't punish believers. Don't ever think that suffering in life is just God trying to get back at you for something. God doesn't punish believers who abide in him in faith. He constantly takes all those hardships and he promises to use them to even make our faith and our, our eyesight are fixing our eyes on Jesus even clearer and stronger. And he uses those things to, to take us closer to his promises. Yes, God doesn't play games. His plans are perfect. And they're plans that ultimately bring us to heaven's, heaven's glory and joy forever. God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, continue to guard and keep our hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now with hymn 319. We sing, On My Heart, Imprint Thine Image. Please be seated as we bring forward our thank offerings to the Lord. <clears throat> 